Praise the Lord. Today we're going to read a Revelation chapter 3. And we'll read from verse number 9 to number 13. Amen. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. So in the ninth verse, again reading it, it says, Behold, I will make of them <clears throat> make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Here is something that is interesting from Jesus Christ. He refers to the synagogue of Satan, a synagogue which must have been in Philadelphia, and it must have been of the Jews. But Jesus also mentioned the same in Smyrna, the church there. In the city there was a synagogue, and uh, he mentioned that it was a synagogue of Satan as well. They had stated, the Lord said, that they were, they were Jews. However, they only lie, according to Jesus. Here the idea is probably spiritual in that the ones who are saying that they are Jews may be only physical speaking, but according to the Spirit of God, they are not spiritually good. Further, when he states that they are the synagogue of Satan, it may refer to the influence that Satan had over the people of the synagogue, which was not of the Spirit of God, but rather Jesus is one who looks beyond that and sees who is the one who is giving the influence. Thus, Jesus was looking at the Jews of that synagogue as having been influenced by Satan. No doubt the Christians were led by the Spirit of God, but the synagogue's people, the Jews that had continued to worship within the synagogues, were influenced by Satan. And that, probably to persecute the Christians, any Jews that had come to worship Jesus Christ in the church at Philadelphia. Thus, what it sounds like is the fact that the synagogue people were severely, severely jealous and trying to persecute or make the Christian church people look bad or evil. Howbeit Jesus Christ himself was the one who had stated that the synagogue's people were the ones who were evil following the influence of Satan. Jesus counted them as liars, not ones not ones who were true, but they were false. Thus, here specifically Jesus named those who were specific liars, not knowing God, and being, one could say, troublemakers for the true people of God. And the reality would be this. No doubt the synagogue there in Philadelphia had heard the message of the gospel, but then they had rejected it. Since they had rejected the message of the gospel, it put them into more peril in judgment. Had they not heard, then there might have been something said by Jesus to the Philadelphia church as to keep testifying to the Jews that were there. Howbeit, since Jesus named them the synagogue of Satan, it follows that they had rejected the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Since he mentioned that they had declared themselves Jews, it follows that this declaring of themselves of Jews refers to the idea that they were descendants of the Jews. But since they had persecuted the Christians and not listened to the message of the gospel or obeyed it, they, by Jesus, were classified differently. He viewed them with much more severity. 
Yet Jesus said there will be a change. They will begin to worship at the feet of the Church of Philadelphia. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Does Jesus really mean that those who were of the synagogue and had professed themselves as Jews, but were not really, would come out of the synagogue and be in worshiping with the Christians? Or does it mean that in the, in, the, uh, in the appearance of them in the afterlife, does it mean that they will finally realize their faults? That in the afterlife, during the judgment, these Jews will finally have to worship Jesus at their feet? Realizing that God had loved them, even though in essence one could say the synagogue of the Jews were persecuting Christians because they assumed that the Christians were on the wrong path. The scripture might go along with this one in Philippians if Jesus was referring to the afterlife. For the scripture in Philippians no doubt has many meanings, but one of them also means that the ones who never declared Jesus as Lord or viewed him as such would one day have to confess and bow down to him, declaring him to be the Lord. Thus, if this is what Jesus meant, then it also follows that those in Philadelphia at the synagogue who called themselves Jews would be in the crowd facing Jesus on Judgment Day, declaring him to be the Lord and confessing to the church in Philadelphia that God really had loved them. And then Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Could there be another truth about this? I refer to the fact that the church at Philadelphia was not rebuked by Jesus Christ. And it could have been that throughout the church age, churches that have lived similar to the church of Philadelphia would have received that same commendation from Jesus Christ. That is, in looking at Revelation and the messages to the churches, no doubt there could be such churches present throughout the entire church age that held to the same characteristics of of the various churches, meaning that though the people from these churches have passed away, other churches throughout the history of the church age may represent the same as the church, these churches, having like characteristics, similar problems. Therefore, Jesus would not have needed to bring about thousands of messages to incorporate in his written word. Instead, seven message of seven to seven churches seems like a number of completion and it is these seven churches of asia that may represent in entirety the commendations problems even of doctrine or praise from jesus for their labor in the things that they had been doing for him thus this church represents not just itself but it represents other churches throughout the history of the church age because of the conditions of government, also the government might have had an effect upon the churches to the extent that the government, a means of force, could have been brought persecution to the church. Howbeit, in Philadelphia, there was no such persecution from the government, per se, but rather from these Jews who purported to serve God. Therefore, though it was one group mentioned, that acted as though they were serving God. Jesus did not recognize them as having influence from him. Instead, they were receiving influence from Satan. Therefore, the Jewish synagogue group in Philadelphia at that time could represent any other group who purports to serve God, but also does the same to the true church, to, in that it may persecute those who follow the God the gospel message or the true gospel message. In verse number 10, it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. There are certain beliefs as to what will happen to the church when the tribulation begins. Some have the belief the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. Some 
have the belief that the church will be raptured, will be raptured before the tribulation starts. Others believe the church might go through it part way, and others might believe that it will go through the entirety of the tribulation period. Within this verse, it could provide to us a key to understanding that the church that has been faithful to God will be raptured out of this world, that being the way God keeps his church out of the tribulation or the hour of temptation, as noted here. The meaning of the word temptation could be a time of attracting one to do things that are not biblical and in line with the true gospel. This sounds like the definition given by Webster's Third New International Dictionary Online, which states, a severely trying experience, a painful affliction. In other words, what Jesus seems to present is the idea that there will be future for the time that Jesus gave this message to the church at Philadelphia, that the whole world would be tried with the hour of temptation. However, the church at Philadelphia would not have to endure this phase. Instead, God would keep that church out of it. Thus, the question that arises is this. First, was Jesus speaking only of one church? Or as mentioned previously, the churches that have risen and have lived out their beliefs, such as the church in Philadelphia at that time there. That brings us to certain conclusions. First, the church at Philadelphia must have been given the opportunity to miss out on severe trials that the other churches that were not aligned with, that were not aligned with might have faced. Or Jesus meant that the church as a whole, faithful to him, would not go through the hour of temptation. Did Jesus only refer to this one church at Philadelphia for not having to go through the hour of temptation? It sounds as though Jesus is referring to other churches, but with the same characteristics. And if the other churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, and so on, were to do the same, why would not Jesus keep them also from the hour of temptation? Since the message is in the word of God and is being read in people's homes throughout the world, beginning at the time that they had placed it into the canon of scripture, then it follows that Jesus meant it for churches throughout the time period of the church. Others might believe that it only referred to one end time, the time of the tribulation, period, which they would say would be the most trying period, time period of all. But then the question comes to mind, why did Jesus tell the church at Philadelphia this? Or is it like other prophecies, prophesying of something that the church in Philadelphia did not have to endure, but yet there's still also the meaning that it could happen along the way and at the end too? If that were the case, then the hour of temptation that the whole world would have to endure, why would it not be written about somewhere and at some time in the history of the church? The truth is we do not have any record as far as we know of a certain worldwide trial period. If that were the case, maybe someone would have written about it. However, the question is, do people really write about temptation or trials. People might write about trials, I would say, but rarely would they mention, if ever, about temptation. Why is it that the word used here in Revelation, temptation? Why not put it in their trial? It sounds as though in future there will be a serious temptation going on that would go around the entire world. If the case be that it only refers to the end rather than at some time that the church at Philadelphia did not have to endure. And then in verse number 11, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that, uh, that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Here is a prominent warning from Jesus Christ about his soon coming. One thing is certain, for example, is this. Under persecution, one would definitely assume that if it were the government doing the persecution, then it follows that a man may lose his job, be put in prison, possibly even lose his life. 
In taking the persecution as a context, people might lose houses, jobs, be put into prison, might even lose their lives for the gospel, or even losing family members to COVID, to disease because of a conviction of their heart to adhere to the gospel, to some conviction of other things. Thus, it could mean persecution as a result of government, but also it could mean persecution from a particular group or groups that may be persecuting Christians. And as a Christian, one should cling to, cling to his God-given convictions regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus, what one may have as regards to temporal things, the things of the earth, such as material wealth, is not something associated, one might say, to a crown, for it is just temporary. Even one can say that a person's job, whether he or she faces persecution because they adhere to the gospel, does not mean that one has lost something of eternal value. One must remember the crown is that which is of eternal value and not temporal value. <coughs> Excuse me. That said, for example, if one remains faithful to Jesus through extenuating circumstances and losing one's family by being faithful to the word of God, when other family members may not, this does not mean that one has lost his crown. For being faithful to Jesus, first of all, brings a reward, but one has to consider the idea of not replacing one's eternal world reward for that which is temporary. That said, in the case of Judas Iscariot, for example, he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, tossing, one could say, away his eternal reward. Though, one could imagine that he could have repented. But the idea is that when one is faced with certain convictions of conscience and one knows to remain faithful to the gospel message and to certain others, one should hold true and not lose that bearing, one could say, for Jesus said that if one remains faithful, in the next verse, the overcomer will be placed as the pillar, as a pillar in the temple of God. In Matthew chapter 10, 34 to 40 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. I, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall they be of his own household. He that loveth father and or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Here, Jesus provides his disciples a measure or, or priority of importance in that God is to be loved above one's father or mother. And if one does love father or mother above loving God, then Jesus stated that one is not worthy of the relationship with Jesus Christ. For the Jesus mentions that one must take up his cross and follow after Jesus, not finding his life, but losing it for the purpose of Jesus. Life in this context sounds like this definition from Webster's Third World New International Dictionary and Abridged. The earthly state of human existence as distinguished from the spiritual state. In other words, the state of this life being of utmost importance and not a, the spiritual state or spiritual life being important. Life might also be a principal basis for enjoyment that one has found. To give that up and follow Jesus Christ in doing his will first and foremost, that sounds like one is giving up his life and attending to spiritual things that are of most concern. In Matthew chapter 19, verse number 27, it says, 
Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, That ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that have forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. To forsake, according to Webster's third New International Dictionary and Abridged, means to renounce or surrender or to quit or leave entirely. Doing this would be for the sake of the gospel. And Jesus said that one would get an inheritance of eternal life and receive a hundredfold. I would also state that some may lose their family, their lands, their houses because of persecution or because they held on to the name of Jesus Christ or the convictions of the gospel and refuse to compromise, one would also, in a sense, be forsaking that other and promote as priority the gospel and the kingdom of God. Thus, the inheritance is greater and more profound. There has been many who have had to give up inheritance, inheritances of land, either willingly or by force, because of the gospel message, and those who do so will be obviously rewarded because of it. Thus, the idea is that some can give up these things willingly for the sake of the gospel, or even because there becomes, there is a fork in the road in which one has to either give up Jesus or give up the family members, the job, or one's own substance because of the convictions of prior, prioritizing the gospel message. Thus, it follows that prioritizing Jesus Christ gives people a greater heavenly reward. Him that overcometh, verse number 12, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is, in, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Well, what is it then to overcome? It is to gain the victory over sin. Here it is stated by Jesus Christ that he would write upon the victor his new name. That is no doubt the name of Jesus. When a person gets baptized in water, in the name of Jesus, there is the name of God placed upon that person. He enters into the family of God. And then finally, in verse number 13, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now here, we're talking about a message that came from Jesus Christ. And at the end, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So actually... Jesus, yes, he was speaking to John, you know, maybe in person as a human being, but it was the Spirit of God that was delivering the message because Jesus is God. So to hear is to listen to the Spirit of God. God's Spirit is that which speaks to us. Jesus is the name of the Spirit. Therefore, one who is listening to the Spirit is listening to Jesus. For here it is Jesus who is speaking. And here it is that he mentions listening to the Spirit of God. And it is what the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, that is the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Jesus speaking to the church. Amen. So, that is about the church at Philadelphia.